let's talk about it. Hello and welcome back to Thick Radio, the podcast where we talk about gaining, fetism, and everything in its orbit. I'm James. And I'm Tim, so let's get into it. Today we're welcoming to the show for the first time. Today we've got Pablo. Hey, Pablo, how are you? Hey, I'm great. Thanks for having me. How are you? Doing good. Good. We are good and we are all the better for seeing your lovely face. You've got this gorgeous smile going on. Oh, it's fabulous. We love to see it. As soon as you can't see, Thanks. Pablo is styling for us here on the podcast today, looking stunning and handsome and gorgeous and thick and lovely. Thank you. So, Pablo, we've brought you on today because whereabouts are you from? I'm from Mexico City. You're from Mexico City, which educated yeah. guest here is in Mexico. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Fairly safe educational guess. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, listen, I'm I'm not the most familiar with North America. You know, you've got like a, a London, Ontario. There's a fucking um, Miami in every state or some bullshit like that in America. There's Birmingham. <laughs> there's Paris, Texas. There's all sorts yeah. of shit. So listen, I ain't taking no supposition. Someone says Mexico City. I'm like, is that Mexico City, Idaho? Like, I don't, I don't know. It, it could be anywhere. But it's Mexico City. Mexico. And I'm actually really excited to have this conversation today because I feel like when I see the American gainers and like gainers from the Americas, like going on about like the best foods to eat to gain weight and they talk about like their favorite junk foods, baby, they're talking about Mexican cuisine. They are talking about tacos. So I'm just like, we need to have more of this, more of that conversation and talking about the culture that makes so many delicious and so beautifully plump. So are we are we ready to get into it? Pablo, are you ready? Ready. Of oh, course. Fabulous. So you're from Mexico City in Mexico. Outside of gaining, tell us what the day-to-day -day life is like. Well, it's pretty um, hectic, I would say, because it's a big city. And there are lots of things to do. There's, I think it's the second city in the world with the most museums just after London so there's a lot of things to see and a lot of things to do there's a lot of variety I think it's not as you know cosmopolitan as Paris or New York but it has a lot of people coming and going everywhere and it's uh, mainly a stop for uh, people who come from South America uh, to go to the US or to Europe or it's like a middle point. So it's very crazy <laughs> living mm. here in the city. It's interesting you mentioned that. It's kind of like a stop point for people in South America. Because I think I sometimes forget that London is like that for a lot of Europe. Obviously, there are still such yeah. huge cities. Amsterdam, Berlin, Paris, Rome, uh, Madrid and Barcelona and so many huge places. But when Europeans want to travel west to America, mm. Generally speaking, like London is kind of that hub before you kind of like branch out and go elsewhere. So it's interesting to consider that Mexico City acts like a bit of a gateway for mm -hmm. South America, right? Like, so that must mean that in Mexico and in Mexico City that it almost lends itself to this blending of a lot of South American culture and cuisine kind of like winds up there and gets fused together and ends up all delicious and yummy. Is that right? Yeah, mostly. And we have a lot of cuisine of our own, but we we also love to have uh, Central and South American food. Oh, because it's a common mistake that um, Mexico is in South America because Americans call us South of America. Uh, of their country you know but it's actually north america yeah um that's another thing i i think would be good to clarify for this here and i'm sure everyone will have their different interpretations but i know that there's references to regions north america south america and central america i would interpret Ooh. mexico to be central but please feel free to to clarify um you say it's part of the north american continent is that right 
Yeah, that's right. And a lot of islands like Cuba and Haiti, Barbados, uh, all of those are North America. I think even Guatemala and Belize are also part of North America. Interesting. I always thought that it stopped at that. Um, so what, Panama is the last country on that little land bridge, right? Uh, I always yeah. thought it stopped at Panama. But those uh, sometimes those Nicaragua and El Salvador and um, all of those are part of Central America. This little... Yeah. That little <laughs> land bridge right there, yeah. Which when I was being educated as a child, like we would, we called it Central America. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, here too. Well, look, thank you for clarifying. I think, like I say, there's, even at the start of this podcast, I think I mentioned Mexico. Like my understanding is that it is classified as Central America because that's just how... I think a lot of the world breaks it all up, you know, that there's like kind yeah. of the, big, the big blobby bits and then it's kind of where it all like snakes into the middle that it all kind of like winds up that way. But then, hey ho, what do we know? We are not Americans ourselves. <laughs> it's not up to us to define that. So thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Mexico was a part of North America here on the podcast. If you didn't know, I've been educated. We now know. So Public. Well, I would think that if you had any kind of schooling in in any part of America, you should know that. Um, it's a common thing. But I don't mind, but many many people get kind of like bummed about that. But I I don't mind. You know, it could be central, it could be north, but I think it, we we're called uh, South America sometimes because we're south of America. You know, of of the United States, <laughs> which the which is weird to me United because. States, yeah. It's weird to me because those people who say that um, Mexico is South America would not say Canada is North America. Uh, yeah, that's they, they wouldn't turn around and be like, oh, yeah, see, this is South America. That's North America. Well, what are you, America? <laughs> <laughs> Central, Central America. <laughs> the, one that, the one that matters. I mean, I'd, I'd love it if like one day they're just like, Europe. Oh, you mean East America? <laughs> <laughs> what do you call Asia? <laughs> West America? <laughs> What's Australia? <laughs> Southwest America. <laughs> like the land down under. Down the, under America. The, the the actual South. I'm from the people in America, I've talked to a lot of like people from the southern US who love to be like, I'm from the South. And I, being from Australia, love to say, I'm from the actual South. The South the planet. So, you know, I'll take my True. South pride. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I did want to ask, you know. And maybe we've already talked about this through this conversation, you know, uh, what is one of the biggest misconceptions people have about Mexico? And maybe that's part of it, but maybe, maybe is there something else that's a very large misconception that people have about life in Mexico? Well, the first one, I guess the, uh, the most obvious would be like, because of Hollywood and all the movies and everything, it's that we're all just a big desert land. That everything looks orangey, or that it's always the sunset, you know, <laughs> those colors. Yeah. I have noticed that too in a lot of films. Whenever they depict Mexico, it's like red, red dirt, and like there's an orange filter on everything. And it looks like it's kind of like aesthetically stuck in the 60s. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, a big one because we have uh, jungles, we have beaches, of course. Well, most of them think. Most of the people think that we're only a hot place, a really hot place. But here, for example, in Mexico City, it's not that hot in winter. And people are always like, why are you wearing a jacket if it's Mexico? Like, <laughs> Well, Mexico City is like 2,000 meters above sea level. And that's like 6,000 feet. So it's very high. So it's cold in winter and in, fall, in the fall as well. I like that. I like hearing that there is that diversity because, I don't know, I think when you go to some places and it's kind of like, I think a tropical island, for instance, is really nice for a holiday. But I think if you lived there, you'd be like, girl, it's summer and winter. It's summer and summer. It's summer everywhere. Like, actually, I kind of miss, like, rain on occasion. You know, like, whatever happened to, like, cloudy days or rainy days where you just, like, stay snuggled up in bed, you know what I mean? You still got plenty of those on an island. There's still plenty of rainy days. I mean, there's always the threat of a hurricane blowing through, but... Yeah, that's true. But I guess it happens to Australia as well. Like, they, they pick big, huge desert, 
Yeah, Australia, I've made this comparison before, you know, especially speaking to a lot of Latin friends who talk about like what like familial culture is like uh, with a lot of uh, Latin families. And I'm like, that just sounds Australian. So uh, I, I am convinced that this is why there's not necessarily a high population of Australians in, you know, uh, the Americas and why there's not a lot of Latin people in Australia, because we're actually just reflections of the exact same thing. Uh, we're just too far apart from each other to connect. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> so I think we, we're, we're similar in more ways than one. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of misconception about Australian weather. Though when it comes to the heat, it's it is hot. It's very, very hot. I also want to ask, what is the culture like in Mexico when it comes to things like being fat, becoming fat, body positivity and gaining because like I said at the start I feel like I see a lot of men in Mexico looking big and obviously I look at that and I'm like that's hot I need to travel there one day I need to see these men for myself but like yeah. what is it actually like with all of that fat adjacency stuff what is life like in Mexico well first of all you're welcome to come anytime you want. you're gonna have fun <laughs> Uh, it's really, really weird because, for example, all Mexican moms are never gonna, well, you're on the street and everything, you're never gonna be called fat. You're fat, you look fat, you, they're gonna call you big. We have a word here in Spanish that means that you're getting mm, kind of bulky, which means, which is embarnecer, and they tell you, you are embarneciendo, like kind of you're bulking up a bit. And they will always feed you everywhere. Like if you go to a friend's house, have you eaten yet? And you always say yes or no, and they'll feed you more. There's kind of the belief still, it's an old one, but that if you're chunky, you're healthier. Because <clears throat> I was kind of wondering, like, I don't know if this is a stereotype. Maybe you can clarify on it. But like, is that a sign of hospitality? Like, and and friendship is like, you have someone come over to your home, you should be obligated to feed them because that's you showing your hospitality to your guests. Like, is that true? Or is that like a cultural stereotype? Uh, that's actually true. You're not like obligated to, but it's a nice thing to, you know, offer coffee, cookies. Uh, if a friend comes when you're about to eat, you invite them to the table. Another thing that's true is that we're the second Play, we have the second place obesity in our country. But what I've noticed is because we have a lot of overweight people, but we're not uh, generally as big as other places. Right. People are kind right. of chunky, kind of fat, you know, but they're not 400 pounds. Uh, it's, it's really rare to see that kind of big people here. Yeah, I'd say, again, similar to Australia, where you, where Tout is having one of the biggest obese populations on the planet, and I'm looking around, like, where, <laughs> where are they? Like, by existing, so many people, like, appear above the BMI average, but I don't look it. <laughs> so. yeah, I mean, when you were in the United States, didn't you notice, like, there's quite a lot of fat people in the United States, and you do see those, like, 400 pounders 500 pounders in your local walmart your local target your local kroger like wherever you're going and it's it's beautiful i was like this this is he ooh baby do you know what that's worth ooh heaven is a fat boy at walmart they say that heaven do 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 yeah exactly that's that's how that when i do my weight gain parody gainer album that'll be one of the songs heaven is a fat boy at walmart in his scooter, picking up his 17th tub of ice cream, putting it, cramming it into that little basket at the front of the trolley, and then just beep beep, <laughs> tuning around corners. It's hot. I love it. But out of, curiosity, out of curiosity, what resources are there for plus size people in Mexico? Because despite there being like, you know, like a lot of Western countries, like a high obesity population in the UK, like fashion whether it's high-end or fast fashion, there's not a lot of options available for the Brits. A lot of sourcing has to be done online and from America. So what options are there in Mexico? Are there a lot? Is the industry burgeoning? Tell me about that. Well, I guess 
we do have clothes for bigger people. That was quite a complaint of mine, actually, when when I was really skinny, because I couldn't find clothes for really skinny men. It was the opposite for me, and I was like always angry about it. But you know, I'm not as big as to have had trouble with that. But I guess there there are options because you know I know really big guys that have really nice clothes. So I don't know if they buy them online, but know that there are clothes for bigger people. But it's good to know that there are options. I feel like Tim. I don't know about you, but it feels like any time we really sit down with a guest and we kind of probe, like. What is it like buying clothes in your country? What is it like trying to get access to healthcare, especially with weight related bits and pieces in your country? For the most part, people are turning around and saying, it's bad, <laughs> it's bad yeah. and there's nothing. Yeah. So it's actually reassuring <laughs> to, to hear someone say, hey, I know a lot of big guys who wear really nice clothes. So listeners, maybe we need to do some digging. If anyone wants to do some research into clothing providers of a Mexican basis, let's find out, sis. Let's get into it because yeah. I wouldn't mind having something cute and comfy to grow into. I am curious to know, what is your opinion on gaining in places where it's more heavily represented? So places like in the US, in Canada, in the UK, in Germany, like what's your take on gaining in places like that? I guess it would be nice to have that here because in the US it's so easy and there are communities, especially in some places like Chicago or San Francisco where there's big gaining communities. Mm. And here in Mexico, it's not like that at all. There are no feeders, like real feeders, mm. <laughs> you know. I don't know where all the gainers my age are because there should be and there, there are none because I'm 40 right now. So the younger people are a bit more open, but they're still like afraid because I've told mm. many of my friends that I'm a gainer mm. and they're okay with it. I've never had anything bad. Oh, well, they, they're concerned. They said, well, you just check yourself and go to the doctor, you know, take care of yourself and you can do whatever you want. So going to other places where it's more accepted, it's different. For example, here you wouldn't get offended if you're called fat. We use, in Spanish, we still use adjectives at people, you know, for references and stuff, and we call each other names. For example, you can call, even if it's not your friend, and you just met, you can say, look at that baldy over there. He won't get offended by it. But mm -hmm. people in the street will generally not bother you. As I've heard, it, it happens in other places. But it's still something that's wrong. You know, you, can, you cannot make jokes about gay people anymore. And you can still make fat jokes all the time, you know, all around the world. It would be great to to go to different places. For example, I met with the feeder uh, with the feeder in New York City. It was different, you know. And obviously, I was taking advantage of all the French fries you get ev with everything. Just the bucket of endless French fries. <laughs> yeah, the sandwich is like this. Did you uh, did you happen to go to a movie theater while you were here? Oh no, but uh, those are great here. So. Uh, it's kind of the same here. You do, they, do you still get that, like the gigantic jug of popcorn? <laughs> yeah, I, when I was in Miami Beach, I saw those. I was hunger, but yeah, it's fantastic. But here, there are some VIP cinema rooms where you can sit at the bottom, and then a, a waiter will come, and you can order whatever. I want to know from you, like, what is your favorite, and we, and I want to center on Mexico here. What is your favorite, like, Mexican snack? drink and like traditional mexican meal like what is your just like mm, top of the list top favorites oh my god there are so many most people think that tacos are coming hard shell that's not true we don't have you know the the folded hard shells for tacos we have tortillas which are soft oh. nice and hot and you can go buy them in the tortilla stores there are stores that sell only tortillas <laughs> and you have them fresh with avocado and everything else but we have tacos of everything mm. everything on them and there's one dish called cochinita pibi which is from the southeast part of mexico and my dad's family is from that area so we love all those dishes from there mm. pork baked uh, in the ground covered in banana leaves 
mm-hmm. with a special salsa sauce. And then you make tacos or sopes or panuchos, which are all based. And oh my, I love tamales. I love layudas. I love pozole, which is a Mexican soup that we mostly eat in September, which is our Independence Day. Mm-hmm. Oh, which the, there's another misconception because most people in the U.S. think that Cinco de Mayo is our Independence Day. It's not. It's in September. <laughs> That's not a surprise, though. Americans will take anything and turn it into an excuse to to celebrate something for ourselves because... Yeah. Cinco de Mayo is now a huge drinking day in the U.S. And like every holiday is a drinking day in the U.S. Like everybody wants to get hammered on a holiday. Same with the U.K., honestly. Like they, it's like, why the fuck are a bunch of British celebrating Oktoberfest? Oh, for all German. No, you're not. You're from Hastings. No one gives a shit, Derek. Does anybody in the U.K. celebrate Bastille Day, though? If, you're, if they're not French? No, I don't. No? No. But then the nope. English and the French you know, are kind of this, like disagreement there. But mm. Papa, it's interesting you mentioned about like the pig that's buried in the ground because in Polynesian culture, this is something that we also have in Australia called a hungi. And basically that is where you get the full beast and you dig a ditch that you can put it in and you wrap okay. that fucker up with seasoning and whatnot. And then you bury it because yeah. it's all hot coals. And then you put the fresh dirt on the top. And you know that it's ready when the steam in smoke is rising from the ground. And you're like, oh, she's cooked. She's she's perfect. And so then you dig it back out and you open it back up. And it's just like the entire animal as it is, you just like stick a fork in it and pull and like all that meat just comes away. And it's just like, oh, oh, <laughs> so good. So I'm gonna need yeah. to try that as well when I come visit. You best... You best make sure I get me, yeah. get me a plate of that. But that sounds so, so, so tasty. What about like a Mexican drink? Is there like a fruit drink or an alcoholic beverage or like a, or like a dairy something? Like what's like the Mexican drink of choice that you love? Well, we have a lot of local drinks from every state because we're divided in 32 states mm-hmm. right now. So each state has its own kind of dish and kind of special traditional dance and music. For example, Jalisco is a state where Guadalajara is, which is a pretty known city. And from that state, we have tequila and we have mariachi. There's other states and we have, for example, mezcal is another beverage made out of it's agave yet and i love mezcal and it comes in many flavors we have in in veracruz we have toritos which are like kind of like a coconut liquor and but we have from a lots of fruits yeah we have cherry uh, liquor we have oh my god uh, almost every fruit we have uh, strawberry and probably banana i don't know strawberry liqueur (laughs) now that does sound nice this is always my go-to thing is like i love a cocktail where i'm just like i need at least a little bit of curacao a little bit of rum and a little bit of grenadine and then just any other fruit flavor i can get in on top of that so that my pint is like full up and then like oh i better top that up and then it's like a little (laughs) bit of lemonade on top and i'm like oh there you go it's a fun cocktail but like the fruit flavor balances Mm. are so perfect that someone sips it and they're like Oh, girl, this tastes like fruit juice. That doesn't taste alcoholic. And I'm like. <laughs> but generally, I either tequila or rum, but mm-hmm. I love mezcal. Now, I do want to ask. Yeah. When you were growing up and when you decided to start gaining, were there ever any characters on TV, any actors, singers, public figures who were big and fat? People who you looked at and said, oh, I want to be like him. Um, Well, we have a lot of American influence here. So I'm trying to remember my first one, like not a cartoon because cartoons had a lot of influence. (laughs) But a person, I remember Dom DeLuise and I remember John Candy as well in Splash. And he was not, he wasn't really, really big, but. Then he got bigger. So I said, yeah, I, I like that look. For example, my grandfather was really, really big at one point. And I wanted to be like him. He was a big influence in my life. And I said, mm, I want to look like that someday. And that was even before I knew I was gay. Like I came out of the closet at 21. 
see, I think that exact same thing. Like I knew that I wanted to gain when I was like seven, eight, nine years old, mm. because I saw these big, beautiful men who I was like, I am just obsessed. And I didn't realize at the time that I was also like attracted <laughs> to these men. Yeah. But I knew that I wanted to grow. And I feel like in many ways, I've said this, my desire to gain and grow supersedes my homosexuality. It comes before, which I think confuses some people, but that that's my truth. It just, it's, it's the most prominent part of my sexuality. Homosexuality comes second. I'm here. I remember I was like three and my dad was really skinny, but I asked him cause he's, he's really smart. And I, ever since I was very little, I was attracted to this because I asked him one day, Dad, what, what's it like to be fat? And he said, I don't know because I've never been fat, but I guess it's just the same as being thin. But I remember asking, like having that curiosity since I was three. Mm. I remember, and I cannot remember when I saw this, and I'm sure I've shared this on the podcast before, but there was one time... I was like, I couldn't sleep and I'm watching late, like early, late night TV that's so late, it's actually early morning TV, right? And someone was doing yeah. an interview with Nigella Lawson, right? Infamously curvy, buxom, beautiful, sultry chef, lady chef, gorgeous, stunning. And they'd asked her, you know, like, what is your opinion on all of this cooking with butter and fat and obesity people become obese what are your thoughts on this and she says i imagine it must have been a delicious journey to become fat and i was like miss nigella lawson is on our team even if she doesn't know that she is she is so on our side for this and i was like that is it when it when i think about me and the life i want to lead i'm fat but having grown up skinny I always really struggled with food because my mom's a shit cook, like devastating. I know, but she is. And I was always like, I think food tastes terrible. How do I gain and get fat if food tastes terrible? I had to adopt this Nigella Lawson idea of things where things need to be delicious. And it's true. When food is delicious, you like, you can make someone a meal healthy and nutritious, but it doesn't taste good. And they maybe can force themselves to finish that plate. But I guarantee you, you make it delicious, baby, they will be licking that plate clean and they will ask you for seconds. That's how you get your calories in. You make food delicious. No questions asked. The people will come and they will grow nice and big and fat. Yeah, you're right. For example, I was talking, my aunt from New York came a few weeks back and I told her because her grandkids don't like vegetables. I said, just add lime and tahini, which is a little, little powder with salt. Add that on the raw vegetables and they will eat them. It tastes yummy and we eat them since we're little and we have no problem. There are carts in the street selling those. With And if you don't like, you know, spicy things, you can just add lime and salt instead of the chili powder. It tastes delicious and you, you'll want more instead of steaming them with salt. Like if you're an adult, you'll eat them, but it wouldn't be your favorite either, I guess. Mm. You have to add like some cheese, cheese and cream or something. Baby, am I, or am I not the butter queen? You know, like, you know me. I'll oh, be, here we go. <laughs> girl, you know, big old knob of butter. That's tasty. That's yeah. lovely. Well, I mean, Tim, to, to bring you into that, you know, because you, you enjoy cooking as well. Like, what are your go-to things when it comes to, like, adding flavor or just, like, zhuzhing up a meal to make it a bit nicer? Well, apparently I don't season things well enough because Matt's only critiques of my food is usually that it's a little too bland. Whereas, like, I was raised by a Polish mother and Polish people don't season their food. It's salt and pepper. That's the most seasoning you ever get out of uh, occasionally paprika. So like I didn't, I guess all my food was bland in the beginning. So now I basically, I take the toppers off of the spices and I just start liberally shaking the spices all over whatever I'm, uh, whatever I'm cooking. Yes. And we buy this. Um, I don't know what company yeah. makes it, but it's called Creole seasoning. And I don't actually know what's in it, but it's like a brand that you buy at a grocery store. 
And now I add that to everything just to add a little bit of heat to whatever I'm making and to make it a little bit more flavorful. Mm. I love that. You do get to a point where when you've experimented so much with food, you, cause it's like, you know, like when you first start learning how to cook, you learn recipes and you learn, I need this amount of meat, this amount of vegetable, this amount of herb and spice. And that's all I use to make the meal. And it turns out the way you want it to, but you get to a point in your life where it's like, I'm not looking at recipes. I'm not looking for new recipes unless I want to learn something specific. I just buy meat, fish, veg, spice. And I'm like, baby, what's, what's going out of date first? Pop that in a pan. I'm working with some fish. What herbs do I have that go best with fish? I'm gonna put some dill on that. I'm gonna put some lemon salt on that. I'm gonna put a little bit of thyme on that shit. I know that's gonna go great with a cream sauce. I'm gonna get some cream on reduction. I'm gonna put some white wine on that if I got some white wine. You know, and it's like, you can create the meal as you go along because you already know it's not about the recipe. It's about the flavor and it's about putting some good shit on your plate and like i say you put that good food on somebody's plate they gonna eat it right because my boyfriend he's put on weight being with me because <laughs> the food is good baby now pub i want to ask you while i know you said like most of the gainers you know in mexico are a bit younger i want to ask you here what what's like one change you would want to see happen in the mexican gainer community Right now, I've been going through this mostly on my own. And what I've seen, not only in Mexico, but all around, is that, and it's not a bad criticism. It's just like, like, I would like to see more videos of feeders, for example, because it always comes to the gainer. Like, uh, I want to see your belly, send me pictures of your belly. But I never see any videos of it. there are like two videos of people encouraging gainers to eat like more participation i wish that there wouldn't be so many bystanders i think <laughs> you know it, it always bums me because we're the ones changing our lives changing uh, exposing ourselves Girl, ain't that the truth you know like hey, tim how many times have we had this conversation about how people love to basically snap their fingers at the gainer come on yeah. performing monkey come on performing pig i want more photos more videos you know i'm gonna yeah. i'm gonna call myself a feeder never never feed you in person never send you any money but i just expect that i'll say words to you and you will miraculously grow for me like, uh, and to be fair, that 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 does work with some people. It does. I mean, we've seen sometime among the Zoom generation that like because they're s separated by so many miles that that is the only option that they have. And some people respond really well to any kind of stimulation on that end. Like sure. someone someone just has to have the conversation with them, and it's enough for them. For people like you and I, we have talked about how we need that in person um, encouragement yeah. because. Yeah. You know, we're a little bit older. We come from a generation before we were constantly on the net, before we had Zoom, mm -hmm. before we had ways to FaceTime. You know, like we, when we were teenagers, if you wanted to see somebody, you had to literally go to their house. You know, there was no other way to do it. So yeah. I think it's just that generational gap is why we prefer an in-person type of situation. Because I know that if uh, someone's like, I'd like to, I'd love to encourage you over Zoom. And I'd be like, okay, so we'll set up an encouraging session and then I'll start to get tired or full or maybe possibly even a little bit bored with the way things are turning out. And I'll just be like, uh, you know, yeah, I got to go. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got stuff to do. <laughs> like, like, thanks for the, you know, thanks for everything. <laughs> Goodbye. You know, that kind of thing. I don't disagree. I think encouragement, you know, and I think we, we've talked a bit about this as well. Encouragement can be both in person and at a distance. And I think in terms of at a distance when people live in you know remote locations or isolated locations that remote encouragement can be a godsend because that might be the only thing they have access to and i think that's yeah. really good to focus on but i think i'm picking up a little bit of what you're saying pub is that you just really want people who are more inclined to do the do and show up for it right and i think sometimes that does come down to showing your face you know if you're going to say to someone i want to feed you don't just say, I want to feed you, show up and do the feeding, make that effort. Sometimes like as the gainer, I almost never get people around to my place. 
I'm always expected to go to someone else's place. And that's frustrating because I'm going out of my way to spend my money to travel. And then apparently I need to buy the food. And look, sometimes it's fine. You do what you got to do. But also, why not come to mine? Why do I always have to travel? No, no, you come to me. I want to sit on my couch, be fed on my comfortable couch. And then when all is said and done, and maybe the sex happens, but even if it doesn't happen and we're all finished, off you go. You can be the one to go home now. I don't want to have to. I've just been stuffed. I'm ready for a nap. I don't want to have to get on the train for an, for an hour and come all the way back home. Even if it is at a distance, because I have many friends from all over the world and it's been wonderful to have this new communication because when I found out I'm gaining there was just as you said like three pages and it was Ellie Builders which still is around and there was Gainer Web I think and Fat Nats maybe it took forever to download one picture you know because <laughs> that's and something I, that the zoom kids don't know nothing about that dial up when you were tying up the phone no, line yeah, and it took no. 20 minutes to download a picture yeah and then your mom picked up the phone and it went all to <laughs> start all over again and it's great to have this right now you know i could go now to england and i have friends there and uh, yes which by the way come to come to london come to london We'd love to have you here I would love to. And I have friends in the Netherlands and I have friends in Germany and I have friends all over the US. I doubt that you would ever have any reason to come to Cleveland, but should you ever find yourself in Cleveland, just let me know. <laughs> Cleveland's not the kind of city that people intentionally go to. Yeah, but it'd be nice like to know other places because I've only to Denver and LA and New York and Miami and Orlando, I think. I think it's something that a lot of people struggle with, but again, I think this is where conversation comes to the salvation. You know, the more we talk about this, the more we share our experiences, you know, like having you on this podcast, being like, hey, this is Pablo from Mexico City. Bitches, if you go to Mexico City, hit this beautiful fucker up. Have a gaming session with Pablo. Go to dinner with Pablo. Hang out with him. Like, we don't need to sit in these isolated realms thinking that we are on our own and must do this alone. Like there is nothing wrong with experiencing this with other people, you know? And I think that's honestly where you get the best out of it because I fantasized for years about gaining and I would jack off. And after that session, I would go, this felt amazing to jack off to how much more amazing will it feel to do this in reality? and come to find I did it and I went, oh my God, this is better than any fantasy could ever be. Same with feeding. I fantasize about feeding for years and I would jack off and afterwards I would go, God, if that felt amazing, how much more amazing will it feel to be fed? And the first time I was fed, holy crap, I was like an animal. I have never eaten so much. And every time I get fed, it's the exact same thing. So honestly, people listening, it is so worth it to connect with and meet up with people who share your views and experiences because I promise you, it is so much better with someone who gets it than it is on your own. Not to shit on doing it on your own because hell, that's most of us most days. But I'm saying if you get the chance, do the damn thing. Now, Pub, I do want to ask you one last question here, which is... What's the question you want to be asked? Sometimes probably even for, you know, the other gainers my age, uh, that they have disappeared. Maybe it's because of the language barrier. There are not many, like all of the, most of the gaining website, websites and everything are in English. So many people do not have access to them as well as, as a bilingual person like myself could. Hmm. That's. That's really interesting. And I, I'm glad that you said that. It's weird. Uh, we have made it with friends here in Mexico. We have, we started and we're not very, we do not post very often, but we have a, also a podcast called El Gainer. Yes, El Gainer. Because oh, yes. you told me about it when we first started talking. Yeah. And we, we chat about the same things that we've chatted here. And it's cool because people who speak Spanish can do it. I would love to, you know, speak Japanese because there are very, very few people in Japan that I've seen doing this. And 
I guess it's because of language mostly. I don't know, but it would be cool to to start helping more people get into it and 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 join and you know experience of what a wonderful thing this is. I'm glad that you brought that up because there's something that that made me think of like, okay, so Grammar and the Grokio apps and all the Gainer websites are aimed at an, at a Western English speaking base, right? Um, and yes, you have Google Translate and you can translate the text on the pages, you know, to whatever language you need, but there is no website that is dedicated specifically for Gainers that speak Spanish and are from a Spanish speaking nation from a Spanish-speaking mm. heritage. There's no website uh, aimed at people who speak Mandarin and who come from Asian culture. You know, like, there that should exist. There should be dedicated Gainer web spaces for those, you know, specific cultures, languages, and peoples. Because really all you're, all we have is, is meant for, and I'm going to say American because they're all American-based companies, and that's really what they're aiming at. They're aiming at an American audience all the time. I mean, this is kind of like where these episodes even came from originally, right? Like we wanted to be very intentional and say, hey, so much of this is focused on the West. Let's be intentional and speak to people who are local to all these other countries. Let's talk to people who are from Mexico or Norway or Guatemala or Singapore or a random Polynesian island. Let's talk to people about what it means to be a gainer, where they are in that moment, because gaining isn't the same thing for everyone it's not complete with the same list of things to do it's not achievable in every same sense for every single person because the whole world is different and diverse so i feel like yes we want to do that and have that listed in these episodes but like you say pablo taking it that step further this relies on people who can still speak english and is reliant on guests like yourself who are bilingual so this is something that you know tim and i have spoken about we want to try and find how do we take what we have done and make it communicable in spanish in mandarin in german in Indo I, do you know what? i was talking with someone just today from indonesia and you know we were talking and he mentioned the podcast he's like my english is not the best but i really like it and actually if you found a way to make this indonesian you would have hundreds of listeners because there are so many people who just don't know English but want to absorb this kind of content so honestly it's such a need that is just we're not we're not doing it and we need to do it so shouting out to anyone who has solutions please reach out to us at the thick radio at gmail.com we would love to be a multilingual podcast that would be pretty <laughs> We said this on our episode on fat podcasting. El Gaina is a podcast that is in Spanish for Spanish listeners. So any of y'all who are bilingual, multilingual, any kind of Spanish lingual, check it out and reach out to the creator and give him your flowers, you know, give him his props and talk to the guests and engage with people because we've always said this we don't want it to be just us out here like having to have these conversations let's make this an international multi-lingual conglomerate thing of just community and conversation and let's make all this shit better for everyone y'all let's do that so public thank you so so much for joining us today it's been a pleasure where can people find you online Thank you, and it's been my pleasure as well. And it's been great. Uh, people can find me as Pablo Space Gainer Grower and uh, Pablo Gainer on Instagram all, all together. And I'm in uh, on Tumblr and Pablo underscore Gainer. You can contact Hugo Hunter at elgainer.com, which is the podcast and uh, some articles we've we've made yes everyone go check out el Gaina, listen to all the episodes talk to the creators give them their flowers support them build it up make it into the next fabulous thing for the spanish-speaking gaining and fetus communities but 
that's it y'all for another episode here on thick radio please remember to like and subscribe rate us five stars and leave us a good review we don't have enough reviews please write us something lovely that would be much appreciated if you liked this episode the podcast or just us in general share it with your friends and encourage them to tune in you can find me on instagram and beefy frat at stanham and you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, and Beefy Frat at Thicky Mouse. You can also look us up on TikTok at Thick Radio or at our website at www.podpage.com forward slash Thick Radio. If you want to submit a voice note, you can reach us at anchor.fm forward slash Thick Radio forward slash message. And if you have any questions or ideas for episodes, you can reach us at thethickradio at gmail.com. So until next time, bye fats. Bye, fats. Bye, fats. Let's talk about it. Dick Radio is a Patreon and Anchor app podcast produced by Stan and Dickie Mouse. Next and Masterclass Stan. Our artwork is provided by Logitech. Our theme song is provided by Spotify Training.